By May 2008, signs were increasing that there would be a prisoner exchange between Israel and Hezbollah. Media speculation was rife that a deal was imminent. At the beginning of June, a meeting was held between the heads of the three major security units in Israel, Mossad, the military intelligence and the Shabak. They concluded that the kidnapped soldiers were not alive. The information was passed on to the chief of staff. Suddenly it was decided to let the army's chief rabbi examine the issue and to consider the possibility of announcing their death and declaring the burial place as unknown. The Israelis were in a dilemma. Declaring the two soldiers dead could weaken Hezbollah's negotiating position. Yet such a declaration, without clear evidence, would likely anger the families of the soldiers and the Israeli public. About trying to declare my son as uh, not alive anymore, it was a spin because the rabbi himself um, made a declaration that it's not true yet. He didn't make to this conclusion. We hope that um, the prime minister and the ministers know that it's few people that hear, but it's people that representing the people in Israel and wanting to end this conflict and wanting to get back Udi and Eldad. Israel's intelligence chiefs were in a difficult position, something that Hezbollah was well aware of. Hezbollah can yakul. Hezbollah was daring Israel, with its mighty army, government and intelligence unit, to announce the death of the two soldiers. This signal was received by the Israelis. And the truth is, they didn't dare declare the death of either of the two soldiers. The issue of the missing soldiers was also causing heated disagreements behind closed doors especially over the terms of any deal with Hezbollah. There were reports that the head of Israel's Mossad secret service, Meir Dagan, argued with the Israeli negotiator over this issue. Dagan reportedly felt releasing Samir Kuntar was too high a cost for the release of what he expected would be two corpses. But Olmert decided to push ahead. The deal was approved in a cabinet session on the 29th of June 2008. The Israeli government, which had declared that it would not negotiate, negotiated. It had launched a war and lost. The return of its soldiers would not happen except through negotiations. To many Israelis, it became clear who had gained the upper hand. I have never heard of a prisoner exchange deal in history where one of the sides didn't know what it was going to get until the final moments of the exchange. In the Druze town of Ebia in southeast Beirut, Samir Kuntar's family was contemplating the significance of his long-awaited homecoming. We don't leave our captured soldiers in prison. That is one of the main principles of the resistance and the return of Samir Kantar at the moment when this will be proven true. Every minute I imagine him walking into the house. I expect him to appear suddenly. I've waited for a long time. God willing, this wait will end soon. Samir Kuntar was being held in Halarim prison near Haifa in northern Israel. Prisoners with long sentences are detained here those categorized as being a high-level threat to the security of Israel. Yaman Zidan, Samir Kuntar's lawyer, was on his final visit to his high-profile client. The chief of Arab prisoners is known for being high-spirited. Now he is feeling even more positive as he's about to be released. Even getting access had been a struggle for lawyer Soha Muntha. She was not allowed into Ashmoret prison to visit her clients, four Hezbollah detainees captured during the 2006 war. Prisoners of the resistance, the ones who are here, are always victimized, even when it comes to their right to an attorney. The court appointed a lawyer for them, but then I was able to get authorization to represent them in court. 
The prison authorities issued me a visiting permit, but after that, their conscience troubled them, and despite the authorization, they denied me entry. But now her clients were also close to being released. The four Hezbollah fighters had been through lengthy hearings at the Central District Court in Nazareth. The prisoners had always refused to recognize the validity of the court. Their Israeli lawyer, Smadar ben Natan, had argued their case. The fact is and the truth is that they are being held as prisoners of war and they are waiting for an exchange of prisoners and the minute there will be an exchange, they will be exchanged and this court, which is only a farce, will end and it will have no meaning and no effect whatsoever on their future. These prisoners are only depending on the exchange with the Hezbollah. In the town of Ait al Shab in South Lebanon, the family of one of the Hezbollah prisoners, Mohammed Sror, followed the final events while preparing to welcome the freed captive. In the nearby village of Yatta, Maha Kurani's family was waiting restlessly. The day of the exchange finally arrived, the 16th of July 2008. In Israel, police and military convoys made their way to the Rosh Hanikra crossing at the border with Lebanon. At the Ras Nakora crossing on the Lebanese side of the border, no effort was spared in marking the occasion everyone had been waiting for. It was time to finally reveal the mystery at the heart of the negotiations, whether the two Israeli soldiers were still alive. A makeshift meeting room was set up in a tent, slightly secluded from the main event. Hezbollah's negotiator took central stage. Members of the International Committee of the Red Cross and Lebanese security officials were there to oversee the exchange. Within moments, everyone would discover the fate of the two Israeli soldiers. Hezbollah had managed to keep their carefully guarded secret to the very last moment. Today we hand Ehud Goldwasser and Eldad Regev over to the president of the International Red Cross. Now the fate will be revealed. The wait was finally over. The remains of the two Israeli soldiers were handed over to the Red Cross. Meanwhile, the Lebanese prisoners were preparing for their final departure. Samir Kunta, one of Israel's most notorious prisoners, was heading home. Crowds of dignitaries, officials and supporters embraced his return. He was given a hero's welcome by those who had fought so long for his release. And then came the bodies. 199 Lebanese and other Arab fighters exhumed from an anonymous cemetery in the north of Israel. In the war-torn southern suburbs of Beirut, celebrations were in full swing. Veteran Lebanon reporter Robert Fisk saw the exchange as merely a continuation of the war. Well, it was theatre. It was meant to be theatre. And I think Hezbollah does this theatre quite cleverly. It's not stupid. They know how to do it. Um, they were playing on their ability to get their prisoners back. Nasrallah said from the start, we will get Kantar back. He said this many years ago. Across the border, the atmosphere was entirely different. Olmert joined military and political leaders to receive the remains of Goldwasser and Regev. 
For the Israelis, the return of the two soldiers was a solemn affair. Eldad Regev was buried in Haifa in northern Israel. In Naharia, Ehud Goldwasser's funeral was attended by thousands of mourners and his army colleagues. The somber occasions were evidence of Israel's much vaunted claim that it always seeks to bring its fallen soldiers back home. Israeli officials confirmed that both soldiers died as a result of injuries sustained during the attack on the 12th of July, 2006. Despite her loss, Goldwasser's mother took comfort in the outcome of the deal. We have a very high level codes of bringing home any um, war prisoners or kidnapped or even bodies, the price was worthwhile. The exchange was made. The negotiations between Israel and Hezbollah had been successful. But only up to a point, since there was more to the deal than the exchange of corpses and prisoners. The negotiations had raised other issues, stretching back more than 20 years which remains shrouded in mystery.